All right. Uh, good to see you guys, Marty and Will. Uh, and, you know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm trying a new format and I'm having multiple guests. So, yeah, today we're going to talk about um, fatherhood, family, and stuff like that. So, you know, glad you guys can be here. I'm excited to talk about this stuff. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm excited <laughs> to learn from two seasoned fathers right here. Well, I, hopefully I, uh, you know, the, the point being, I want to get people excited about fatherhood, right? Cause, uh, there are many people in this community that are maybe not married yet or are married and don't have kids yet. And, you know, uh, the idea being, uh, you know, this is, this could be potentially your next step. So some, something for people to think about. So let's, let's start with, uh, your journey, right? Like how'd you end up where you are right now? Like in terms of family and stuff like that. Oh, uh, so for me, <laughs> uh, I've got, so just the level set I'm married, mm -hmm. been married for six years now. Mm -hmm. We have two mm -hmm. boys. One's almost four and one's one in mm -hmm. 15 months. So he's mm -hmm. one year, th three months old. My wife and I, and I think this is like a good level set to like really dig into like family, not just nuclear, but extended. Mm. So I've known my wife my whole life essentially where, mm. um, but she's a bit, she's a few years older than me mm. and she was best friends with my cousin growing up. I come from a big Irish Catholic family. I have 25 cousins. That's awesome. my mom's the youngest of eight and her brothers and sisters are really close. And so by extension, me and my cousins are really close. I consider my cousins like just brothers and sisters, mm. um, at the end of the day. And my wife, uh, was best friends with my one cousin and went to high school together, hung out, uh, in college. And we all went to the same shore town that we still go to mm. in the summers. We just actually got back on Saturday from our vacation down the shore. Mm. And so we met, um, we, we knew each other, uh, growing up. I knew of her mm -hmm. just via my cousin. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, they, finally, when I was 18, I snuck into the bars that they would all go to and uh, <laughs> hit on her for the first time. And she sort of level set. She's like, you're a bit too young for me. Uh, come, back, <laughs> come back later. And then when I was of age uh, at 21, I, I, I persisted in my pursuit of her. And uh, we started dating and then eventually moved to New York. Uh, when I was 22, we lived together, got married, uh, and then... I got, I was 25 when we got married. We had our oldest son when I was 28. Wow. That, yeah. that's fairly, fairly young. Yeah. yeah. These yeah. days. Yeah. yeah. Well, my parents, my parents were 21 when they had me okay. and then they were 22 when they had my brother. So <laughs> <laughs> how about you, Will? Um, let's see. Craigslist. No, um, <laughs> no, uh, Annalise and I met, uh, in New York city. Actually, I'd mm -hmm. been living there for about two years and mm -hmm. she had just graduated college uh -huh. meant very traditional, just mm -hmm. like with other friends. I had friends from college uh -huh. that her cousin who she was rooming with were friends with. Uh -huh. And so we just met up, you know, going out to dinners and you mm -hmm. know, all the, you know, young 20 something New York life, mm -hmm. uh, sort of thing. Um, but we actually, you know, I guess the one unusual thing is we dated for a while and then uh -huh. we stopped dating because uh -huh. she moved away from New York as uh -huh. many people do. And there was nothing bad about it, but uh -huh. we just, you know, uh -huh. went on our way, but she moved back uh, to go to grad school uh -huh. at Columbia and things lined up well. Mm. And, uh, it wasn't long after that, that we decided that we're going to move back to Austin because mm -hmm. we had a set a date for getting married, mm. um, and knew that we wanted to have kids and knew that we wanted to do it outside of New York. I mean, New York's great, but, um, not for kids. I'd, I'd watch my brother. <laughs> I'd watch my brother have his first kid in mm -hmm. New York. It was, it was hard. Like, mm. um, so we decided to come back here, um, mostly because, you know, for the, you know, purpose of mm. starting a family. Um, Took us a little bit longer to get going than, than Marty over here. We're not Irish Catholic. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we take it a little bit slower, uh, the, these Protestant Protestant people. But um, uh, no, we, we had our first kid and we got, actually today's our anniversary. Mm -hmm. So oh, eight years. Wow. Yep. Going to wrap up this podcast and head back home. And then. Um, Sorry, Annalise. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, we, we got married in 2015 and then uh, had our first kid in 2018. Okay. Yeah. So you guys come from kind of bigger families or smaller families. Is, is this something that you guys always wanted? What, what's, what's the deal there? I mean, I have a big extended family mm -hmm. and a, uh, a nuclear family that's over the birth rate. I'm the oldest of three. <laughs> okay. Um, 
But yeah, no, I think my mom's side, the family, my mom's side, she's one of eight. My dad's uh, the oldest of two. Um, and so obviously on my mom's side, we have a ton of cousins. And again, we hung out together all the time. Mm. Like not only just holidays, like on weekends, we go to my aunt and uncle's house and all the kids would be there and the parents would be talking. And then in the summers, we literally lived on an Island within like a five block radius of each other the whole mm. time. And so we, um, we were together all the time and that obviously stuck with me. Uh, and like the, the f- strong extended family is something that, yeah, I aim for mm. in my life too. Like I want my kids to have that same experience and they do. It's interesting. Um, even though we're not brothers and sisters, my cousins and all of our cousins are pretty close. And so like this summer, that's why we go to Jersey. Number one, it's hot here in Austin. And number two, we do have that. I, I do think the old adage, it takes a village is true. And it's pretty beautiful where we go. We go to the beach. Um, we've been going to the same block that my grandparents bought a house or rented a house originally 60 years ago. Um, and then my aunt and uncle eventually bought the land and built their own houses and they, they own the property now, mm. but we all go to the beach and it's a massive circle, multi-generations. You have grandparents, uh, our generation, then our kids and they're just in the middle. Mm. Uh, and it's pretty beautiful in the sense that everybody's together everybody's seeing how the parents interact with their parents, uh, from a young age. And that's what my upbringing was like. Uh, and then you do have the village. So it's, mm. you get sort of built in childcare as well. Like you don't <laughs> have to have your eyes zoned on your kid at all times. You have that everybody in the circle, like notices a one or two year old wandering. They're like, Hey, get back over here, get back in the circle. Yeah. I mean, not a particularly big family uh, Mm -hmm. on my side. I'm one of three. Um, but, Mm -hmm. and not that this is a prerequisite, you know, for Mm -hmm. having a larger family or a family at all when you're older, but it never occurred to me. It never occurred to me that I wouldn't have a family and kids. Mm -hmm. Um, I had an idyllic childhood, Mm -hmm. very close to, uh, both my siblings, Mm -hmm. both my parents. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm close to, you know, my sister-in-law, my brother-in-law, their kids. Uh, so we're building a, a pretty big extended family. But when I was growing up, you know, I had family out in West Texas and, Mm -hmm. Um, most of them ended up in jail, uh, before they're 18. So we just didn't have that much of a relationship. Uh, but, uh, uh, what does my dad always tell me? He's like, uh, you know, when I, when I talk about my extended family, I'm like, oh, that scares me about, Mm -hmm. you know, having kids a little bit Mm -hmm. is that, you know, you don't know how they're going to turn out. Mm. And my dad will just nod and go. Um, his line is, uh, you have, um, uh, was it? Oh, with kids, you have some influence and no control on how they turn out. And he's like, don't, don't blame them. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, um, no, I actually had some great cousins as well, mm. but, uh, um, no, I mean, for me, it was just, I, I never considered not having a family. Mm. Um, mostly because it, I had such a great childhood and I had such a great upbringing. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, I think that a lot of the values that my parents put in me, like I felt like it was my responsibility to Mm -hmm. continue the trend. Well, did Bitcoin change things at all in terms of your thinking about, uh, families and like how, how you were going to conduct yourself or how the trajectory of your family life might be? Yeah. I mean, for me personally, I think learning, yeah, my parents were really young when they had us <laughs> and we want, like my dad was in, um, asset management, he helped raise money mm. for funds for our RIAs from RIAs. And, um, I watched him growing up, get pretty beat up with the, the market cycles. Like mm. in 2000, we moved to South Carolina from the Philly area because mm. he took over the Southeast section of the country, uh, the territory. And then 2001, 9-11 and, mm-hmm. uh, happened in the markets crash and he got laid off almost mm-hmm. immediately and saw him sort of struggle through that. He had to take a job as a bellhop at a hotel when we were down there and then eventually mm-hmm. picked himself back up from his bootstraps, started his own firm, mm-hmm. uh, and built that up. And then 2008 happened and he got beat up again. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it was, it always felt like to me that my parents were trying to like catch up. They had mm-hmm. kids when they were young and, um, they provided us with incredible educations. We went to, uh, my brother and I went to an all 
oh guys prep school and Mm -hmm. my sister got a good education and they really focused on that part of our lives particularly is like hey we're going to invest in your education and Mm -hmm. i think it's paid off significantly for me personally um but yeah like i think bitcoin particularly like I, i don't think my parents ever really had the ability to save mm. correctly um, throughout the first 20 years of my life. Mm. Uh, and when I found Bitcoin around that age, around 20, 19, 20, I think it wasn't immediately, but over time learning from people like you two, um, <laughs> uh, like I should have a focus on like building a nest egg and um, really building up that savings account. So I don't have to have that stress and go through that volatile cycle that I watched my dad go through going up. Yeah. I mean, same, same thoughts on my side. I mean, the way Bitcoin made me think about the family is mostly around, you know, time preference Mm. and uh, making sure like, you know, there's a lot of ingredients that go into how how big your family is Mm -hmm. or anything like that. But it did make me feel like, well, I'm saving in Bitcoin and uh, I know this is going to sound crazy, Mm -hmm. but like at least, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, I'll be financially secure as I raise these kids. Mm. Like, um, you know, having 401ks and, you know, making a big salary, you know, never made me feel comfortable Mm. um, ever. Mm. Um, And, you know, the idea of saving in Bitcoin instead of dollars, um, you know, it's, it never occurred to me that it would be hard to get dollars. You know, mm. I hear they're making more of them. <laughs> I, I can get some, right. But that wasn't, you know, financial stability and definitely, you know, when I was starting a family, like one of the goals is to provide financial stability, you know, throughout the child's lifetime. Mm. And, um, by saving in Bitcoin, it made me more confident in, in going in and having shooting for a bigger family mm. for sure. Well, so one of the things that I, I, I've noticed with a lot of men is that after you get married, like you kind of go up a level in terms of your career. And also maybe after you have children, you go up another level. Uh, like there's like, you become almost hyper efficient at, at a certain point. First of all, do you guys experience that? And second, why, why do you think that is? What's going on? I mean, I, I certainly have, I mean, I got married in April of 2017 Mm -hmm. and again, I was like, so I've Mm -hmm. went to a good college. I got a good degree. I got a good Mm -hmm. job out of college, but I never liked having a boss. Um, so I quit my job and went to go learn about front end development and, uh, app development to get into tech from finance. And then I moved to New York and worked in software sales for a bit and, eventually came to hate my job and quit thinking I'd be able to find a job rather quickly. And I wound up being unemployed for like a year and a half and Mm. God bless my wife. Like we got engaged and married in that period. Mm. And so when we got married in 2017, I was actually unemployed. Mm. Um, I was very into Bitcoin trying Mm. to figure it out. And uh, we got married in April and after getting married, I was like, I have a wife now I've got a supporter. I can't be a deadbeat unemployed Mm -hmm. individual anymore. And and, uh, that, coincidentally was when Bitcoin price started running again towards $2,000. And I found this opportunity like, all right, how am I going to level up? I know a lot about Bitcoin. There's a lot of people want to learn about Bitcoin. And so Mm -hmm. I started the newsletter in June of 2017, two, three months, two months after getting married. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And I do think there was this like subconscious drive to like, all right, I'm married. I've got a responsibility. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've got to go do something. And luckily for me, I didn't have to have a boss. I was able to do it myself. And six years later, like have my own company Mm. and, um, and running it and control my own destiny. Um, and yeah, it started getting married, but yeah, like you said, once you have kids that that gets jumped into, to like hyperspeed and it really, once you're holding your child, it looks exactly like you're like, holy crap. Like I don't (laughs) ever want you to have the stresses that I had growing up. Mm. It's not a coincidence, right? Mm. You know, you're more valuable mm. uh, in your late twenties and early thirties, and that's mm. usually when people are having kids mm-hmm. to start out with, unless you're Irish Catholic and you're 21, <laughs> and, and you're not that valuable yet, and, and you work your way up. Um, mm. But also, you know, we've literally been doing this forever. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, is that you know you you get a partner, you get <laughs> married, 
you have kids <laughs> and your job is to provide for them like yeah. this mm -hmm. like forever. That's what men have had to do. Mm -hmm. And so it's built into us, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, working office jobs or, mm -hmm. you know, working outside, it doesn't really matter. Um, and plus, you know, hopefully, um, you're worth something when you make that decision. Right. And I mean, I, I do think that like, if you're thinking about starting a family or something like that, like you really need to consider how you're going to provide for them because that is your, that's your job. Mm. And, um, uh, that's, that's your main job at that mm. point. Um, and hopefully around the time you're trying to make that decision, you've made decisions before that to make yourself more valuable in the marketplace. Mm. Um, I think generally that's the way things go. People have kids earlier. That's all fine. Like mm -hmm. it happens, but, um, like, I don't think it's a coincidence. It's like how we're wired to behave because we have done that forever. Mm. Yeah. So that, that is something that you guys experience that there is maybe a little bit more pressure and like, uh, in, in a sense, you, you emerge from the pressure with sort of more ambition, maybe more energy, more determination to provide value. I don't know. It's just not the way my, my brain's wired. I don't feel any <laughs> pressure around it. Right. It's it like, you make a series of decisions, you know, in my case, it's like, you know, it's not an accident. Uh -huh. Like I, I knew when I was 14 that I was going to have kids when uh -huh. I was older. Right. Mm -hmm. It was just never like an option not to. And you just have to make sure that you're progressing your own skill set in the marketplace to make sure that when the time comes that you're able to provide for them. Like it's, it's not a serious, I mean, I, I get it like mm -hmm. money problems and things like that do pop up. But again, you know, at least for now, like you can settle most of your obligations in dollars. Mm -hmm. They are making more of them and you can go get them. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I'll take the other side. Like I felt immense like pressure to, <laughs> to level up. Um, especially like our oldest was born in February, 2020. So right before lockdowns, so uh, we were still in Brooklyn at the time. Yeah. And on it, like maybe it was just because I'm a Bitcoiner, mm -hmm. uh, who's, um, more perceptive to bigger trends that are happening. But we, he was in our studio apartment in Brooklyn for two weeks before I was like, all right, we're getting out of here. Mm. It was before lockdowns happen. Um, but no, I do think that having him, like this young baby and like seeing COVID begin to spread and like the narratives around it begin to build. I, I made like, I leveled up and made a quick decision. Like, all right, we're getting out of here. Whereas I, do you think if it was just me and my wife in that studio apartment, we would be a bit more complacent, like, oh, yeah. we'll be fine. Yeah, there, there's, uh, I think maybe like uh, an immaturity that maybe you're forced to kind of deal with. I probably would have had kids earlier in my life if I hadn't been living in New York. Mm. Uh, there's like, you know, you know, God bless you and God bless my, <laughs> my brother, but you were, you were the first in your nuclear family to have kids, so it was mm -hmm. my brother. I got to see that firsthand, mm -hmm. you know, from watching my brother do it. And I do think there's a little bit of like arrested development that mm -hmm. happens when you're in your late twenties mm -hmm. in New York city. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I probably wasn't actually like behaving like a grown up, mm -hmm. like a responsible person that should be having <laughs> kids at that time. Nothing. I wasn't like uh -huh. wild or anything, uh -huh. but like, yeah, I just wasn't there mentally. Mm -hmm. And so the, like that escape from New York for me definitely delayed like when when I had uh, a family just because I wasn't living the lifestyle um, of someone who should have kids at that time. I guess I'll take back the pressure side though. Like I, I think I was too focused on like financial pressure, but like mm. learning about schools, like schools are really different than when I was a kid, mm. like really different. Um, um, and uh, I had to, you know, navigate that and mm. wanting, I loved for the most part, my education and everything mm -hmm. was fine. Mm -hmm. Like, I had no complaints. I went to public schools mm -hmm. up until high school. And then I went to high school to private school and then to college. And that was all great. But again, getting to see an, an older sibling with, with mm -hmm. kids navigate public schools, the same public schools that I went to <laughs> and seeing how honestly terrible they were. Mm -hmm. Um, it, that, that was a lot of pressure to sort of figure out how we we're going to do early childhood, mm -hmm. uh, education for sure. Well, do you, do you guys feel like you're better men as a result of this? Like, do you, do you feel like maybe you missed out on some of the stuff that maybe your uh, friends that didn't get married or have kids 
get to experience or like, how, how do you feel about where you are in life right now? I feel pretty good. <laughs> uh, not as well traveled as many of my friends are, but I don't know. I, I think, uh, I know there's, there's no way to describe like the joy, like having kids brings you. Um, and you can't explain it to people who don't have kids. You can try to, but they don't get it. And we were just discussing mm -hmm. this in the podcast we recorded before this for TFTC, but like there is particularly my, I'm 31 and like, I'm in like the prototype prototypical archetype generation of people who are like wander have wanderlust and aren't starting families because they don't think it's economically viable or they'd prefer to go out and party than take care of a kid. But I think for me personally, it's been incredibly rewarding and it's hard to express that to people um, unless you just have them over your house and you give them FOMO <laughs> that also can act uh, can be counterproductive because they see how exhausting it can be. And they're like, Oh God, do I want to do this? I don't get it. I see people complain about it, uh -huh. you know, or brag about it, you know, uh -huh. about being, you know, single, you know, uh, with no kids and stuff like that. But I don't know. I mean, I can put myself through the thought experiment uh -huh. or, or even just, uh, you know, the empirical who I've known in my life, which is like, and I don't mean to like denigrate anyone who chooses not to, mm -hmm. you know, have a family or anything like that, but I'm going to, um, <laughs> which is like, I don't know. Have you ever met a seven year old mm -hmm. who's super happy? They never had kids. <laughs> what makes a 70 year old happy? They're children, their children yeah. right? I mean, grandchildren, you, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> grand and grandkids is like, um, it's not just about having the kids, but it's about, about having a good relationship with them when you're older, mm -hmm. right? And like, um, you know, I was friends with all my friends' parents and things like that, and I can see what makes my parents happy, what makes them happy, mm -hmm. and it's their kids. Like, mm -hmm. that's all they, that's all that makes them happy in their later life. And I think that that's mostly true for most people. Mm -hmm. And I remember my, even in my early twenties, I could imagine myself as a 60 year old or a 70 year old, or mm -hmm. hopefully an 80 year old. Mm -hmm. And like, what would make you happy? Like, what do you want to do to set up like a happy life? Mm -hmm. And, um, I can't think of a single person that it, in my life that I knew at that time mm -hmm. who was over the age of 60, say that was happy that didn't have kids uh, and, or didn't have a good relationship with their kids. Um, which isn't completely in your control. I mean, mm -hmm. it's partly at least. So this idea that like, um, that, um, you know, the time commitment or mm -hmm. you're, or that you're sacrificing and giving up, like you're definitely sacrificing some things, um, uh, that you could have been doing without them. But those, the, the opportunity cost of the things that you could be doing the way you could be spending your time seems it seems like a, just an overwhelming bet mm. towards having children at this point is it's it's you know I, I get to go to greece for two weeks mm -hmm. you know when i'm 36 one time and spend a bunch of money on that and then come home for what you know like <laughs> is, is, is is world travel all that important can't you do that when you're a little bit older can't you do that with kids also mm -hmm. you proved that right yeah. you just went around the world with your kids um is going out to bars you know when you're 36 kind of sad <laughs> on tuesday nights you know like yeah you could just stay home with the kids it's, it's okay you're not missing out on anything this idea that you're missing out on some great life because you're raising children and, and bringing them up in the world is nonsense. And the other side of that too, is like you, you actually think you're missing out on all the hedonistic stuff, going to the bar, traveling, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily hedonistic, but you're mm -hmm. not fulfilling your wants, uh, to the degree that you would not be able to, if you did have children, like the other side of that coin, Seth Dillon runs the Babylon B. It's funny. We're talking about this cause he had a great tweet thread over the weekend where he really like, through the argument back at the people who are like, I'm going to miss out on all these experiences. Like when you have kids, you get to relive the all of exp experiencing the world for the first time, having like first time experiences that in the magic of that, you get to relive that through your child's eyes. And I experienced that in the last two days. Like when we got back from Jersey preparing for my oldest son's first day of school, like simple things like, Oh my God, my green backpack. He's like so <laughs> jacked up. He's got a new backpack, a new pair of shoes, like a new nap mat. And he's just like anybody who came in our house, he's like, look at my green backpack. And I remember 
having that that feeling like the first day of school yeah Yeah, huge (laughs) it's just like seeing that pure joy of something as simple as having like a new backpack is like there's Mm -hmm. nothing that can describe like the feeling of like viewing that through my 32 year old eyes like Mm -hmm. um and be like i remember that experience i'm pumped you're having that experience like (laughs) that's like an experience you you can't describe articulately but you're not going to get um, you can't ex- describe articulately to the people like, Oh, I'm missing out and all this travel and all this time out with my friends and the concerts. And to your point too, and Seth Dillon actually said this in his sweet thread too, you can still have those experiences. You just get to experience <laughs> them with your kids. You like, just drag them out to Germany yeah. with you. You don't take them to the bar to close, but you know, do other things. <laughs> well, wait until they're 21, I guess, or something like that. I don't know. You know, it is your job uh-huh. at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. It's like, I don't have like a deep philosophical take on this uh-huh. or anything. And I haven't, you know, read all the books on, uh-huh. on this that I probably should have, but like, you know, you know, I do know that like, you know, if enough people don't have kids, nothing works. <laughs> like, literally nothing works in the world. Um, so yeah, I mean like, you know, there's this like this feeling of responsibility, um, you know, not, not just yourself, but like, you know, if you want to take it up a step is like the human race doesn't work if people don't make families. It, it really doesn't. Well, so that, that brings up uh, something else, which is, you know, societally, like, there are way less people having kids. There are way less people getting married. Like, how, how do you, um, well, first of all, do you try to encourage other people to get married and have children and do these things? Or do you just sort of shut up about it in front of, in front of your friends, I guess, that are not in your situation? I don't know. I very deeply believe that, mm-hmm. you know, people that want to have kids should have kids and that mm-hmm. people that don't mm-hmm. should not, mm-hmm. uh, you know, people that don't want to have kids really should not have kids. <laughs> like, <laughs> they really, really, you don't want them having kids. But if people are on the fence or want to mm-hmm. talk about it, I've talked to several people that were apprehensive or mm-hmm. even just nervous about, mm-hmm. uh, about, uh, starting a family in that, in that way. And, you know, I'll, I'll just tell them the truth about mm-hmm. my experience. And, you know, I, I, I didn't like, receiving that, uh, that, uh, that type of advice when I was, you know, mm-hmm. about to start a family, I remember people telling me, you know, how hard it was and what you're mm-hmm. going to miss out on and like all that. I didn't really, mm-hmm. it's not my experience. Mm-hmm. Like it's not that hard. Like mm-hmm. teaching a two year old how to do stuff honestly is not hard. <laughs> you just tell them what to do and then eventually <laughs> they'll do it. You know? They won't do it for a while, but eventually they do. It's not, it's really not hard. Uh-huh. The time commitment, it's like, what else are you going to do? Like, <laughs> like sleep until 10. Like, uh-huh. you know, you got a job to go to anyway. Like, mm-hmm. you know, um, it's, uh, I think people try to psych you out on, um, on the negative sides of it as if they're preparing you for something that mm-hmm. is negative. Um, and again, there are, there are bummers of days and things like that. Um, but I, it, it, it blows my mind how many people will try to sort of warn people off mm. of like, well, you know, <laughs> it's going to be a whole different life for you. It's, like, it's not that different. Like, um, <laughs> it's really not that different. Uh, and it's not that hard. Literally everyone mm-hmm. before you has done it. Mm-hmm. Like again, your, your program to be good at this. Um, <laughs> and most people are, I think like, mm-hmm. uh, most people are pretty good at, 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 at being parents and, um, yeah. So, uh, you know, p- people might be having fewer kids, um, for other reasons, financial or something mm-hmm. like that. And I get it, but, um, certainly from like, uh, uh, again, the opportunity cost uh, of the, like the selfish, mm-hmm. you know, what am I going to be doing with my life sort mm-hmm. of thing? It's like, it's fine. You, you'll, you'll have a life. It'll mm-hmm. be okay. Yeah. yeah. You'll get less sleep. You'll wake up earlier, but you'll find that not necessarily the less sleep part, but like waking up earlier, it's like, Oh, there's cooler things to do in the morning. Like now that I'm up at 6am and go for a walk with my kid, I can take him for a ride. You know, like mm-hmm. you find other things to do. That's like the biggest warning I got was like prepare to not sleep that much and wake up early. I was like, all right, like I can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But yeah, I think just before even having kids, like getting married, you have to do that first or you should do that first. I think Mm. Um, today's culture. Yeah. I think it's completely corrupted by like the optionality of these dating apps. Yeah. I mean, the whole topic of body count has been pretty big on, on Twitter and 
people have been psyoped into believing like just delay, delay, delay. Mm. And I've become more convinced. And I think my wife and I are like a good example, not directly arranged marriages, but mm-hmm. like somewhat, mm-hmm. like, I really, <laughs> <laughs> like, I think the way pretty close. my wife and I got married was like great. Like her parents, um, they're older than my parents, but they're very close to my aunts and uncles. And I know the fact that she's best friends with my cousin, <clears throat> um, and grew up like in the same culture and had the same family values, obviously, since parent parents or friends of my aunts and uncles to share my values. Like it was very easy mm. for me to, uh, pursue her. Cause I knew like, Hey, we're pretty aligned. Mm. I like you. You're cute. You make me laugh. <laughs> and, uh, um, but yeah, there's been this whole wave of these dating apps and this that create like all this optionality, just literally swiping and there's always another option out there. And, and people, I think that's the biggest hurdle to family formation these days is the marketplace for dating where there's always a better option out there. You can always swipe right one more time if, and find a better mate. And everybody's got that optionality in their mind. Like maybe this isn't the best um, best mate for me in the long run. Let, let me go find another one. There's just this inability and apprehension to to settle that most people in my generation have today. A lot of people, I won't say most. Well, so what what advice would you give to a single guy that wants what you guys have, which is a wife, a family, like, you know, some of, some of the benefits that we're talking about, like, like you guys are saying the dating market is just really tough right now. And, um, you guys maybe didn't come through the door that most men are trying to go through. So, like what, what advice would you give them or how would you, how would you help them? I guess. It's hard. Like, I mean, I don't know. Like dating apps were just becoming popular. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I met my wife in 2008, 2007, mm-hmm. 2008. And, um, and so like there were dating apps and like mm-hmm. they were around, but there was kind of a stigma around them at that time. <laughs> There's not a stigma anymore. Uh, it doesn't resonate with me particularly. Like mm. I, I don't see anything wrong with it. I mean, I know people have met online mm-hmm. and uh, met through dating apps and they have great relationships. Like I, I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with that, but um, I mean, it really does matter who you pick as a mate. Like it matters a lot. Mm-hmm. Like, like, you know, you don't want to just like say, well, well, it's my job to start a family. Mm-hmm. So anyone will do like, <laughs> Like the John that, McAfee way. That's a, that's a bad way to, to, <laughs> to go about it. And it really does matter um, uh, who you choose. Mm. That's a, it, it, it is a big decision. So I understand like the, the um, like if you're taking it seriously, um, I, I do understand like the inclination to, to be careful with that decision. Mm. Um, but um, I don't think, you know, necessarily the, the right answer is going on 20, 40, 60 dates a year or something like that. I mean, uh, my suggestion, I mean, dating apps seem fine. Um, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, I don't know how they work that much, but like <laughs> focus less on the photos and more on the interests probably <laughs> like uh-huh. sharing interests is a big deal. Um, mm-hmm. wanting to spend time together and do things together is a big deal. Um, but also, you know, making sure you have, you know, I think like the values part is like the hardest part mm. is, uh, cause when you start a family, like it's not about whether you and her get along. Mm-hmm. It's about how you want to raise these kids. Mm-hmm. And um, you better be pretty aligned on that. I mean, you'll have, you can get through some differences, but like, um, you know, you know, if something's a, a big sticking point for you, like how you're going to educate the kids um, and you'll have diametrically opposed uh, views on that, it's not going to be a fun, it's not going to be a fun time. So it is really, well, well I'll say like, you know, the dating app stuff, a lot of it seems seedy and, uh, and kind of gross to me. I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with it if you're making the decision on the right sort of merits. Yeah. And I guess the advice I would give is not that I'm one to give advice and, um, I don't want to come off as some type of manosphere influencer, but it would be, uh, <laughs> I'm already regretting some of the things. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean like, like, Go into like dating, especially at a younger age with intention, like with Mm. intention, like don't like go on these apps to like Mm. find somebody to 
go get drunk with and maybe have a one night stand with. Like mm-hmm. I highly recommend being intentional mm-hmm. earlier. And I can speak from experience. Like I started dating my wife when I was 20, 21 mm-hmm. been together for 11 years. We're very happily married. Mm-hmm. Obviously we have our ups and downs. We have our fights every now and then, but we love, love each other dearly mm-hmm. at the end of the day. And I, I think it's just, and my wife will always joke. Like I'm an old soul. Um, <laughs> my parents identified that earlier and, I don't know, for some reason or another, I always knew when I was younger, I wanted to get married relatively young and I was intentional. Started courting my wife when I was 17. Um, And I think, yeah, I don't, looking back now, 32, married six years, two kids, like not having the stress of having to find a mate at this point, being able to focus on my family and my career is like, I think the intention that I went into early in life is paying off now. I I do feel like uh, it is a really rough world out there for those guys that are trying to find a mate. And in a sense, the, you know, the, the apps have a lot of power and there isn't sort of like the world that you guys came from. So I I can imagine someone watching this saying, Oh, these guys had it easy. You, you, you had like a family. We might, we may have. Yeah. Although, you know, when, when we were dating there, you know, I was in a different city. I was uh-huh. meeting, I, I was from Texas living uh, in New York and the girl I was trying to date was from Wyoming uh-huh. living in New York. You know, that was pretty weird. Uh-huh. Even like 30 years before that, like yeah. that wasn't a traditional way to meet someone. It, it changes like, mm-hmm. but um, there's, there's a lot, a lot of nice girls out there there's a lot of <laughs> nice guys out there. Right. And like the environment that you meet them in, if you're just on trashy apps and mm-hmm. swiping on them, like maybe that's not going to work. But like, we we go to a church here mm-hmm. in Austin. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't grow up particularly religious or anything like that, but you know we're raising our family mm-hmm. going to church. It was one of the things that we agreed on very mm-hmm. early. Um, and um, I'm shocked how many people I can tell mm-hmm. are not married and dating that mm-hmm. are in church together on mm-hmm. on Sundays. <laughs> shocked. There's so many of them. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of young families also and old mm-hmm. you know everything like that. There's a lot of different contexts in which you can meet someone. And I think maybe people, maybe I wouldn't know this for sure, but maybe people feel forced towards the, you know, the mm-hmm. app dating culture. Mm-hmm. People are doing other things. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there, there's meat space out there to, to meet people um, in, in the various cultures we have in any, you know, city or state or anything like that. Like mm-hmm. um, maybe, maybe getting offline for some people is the right idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I think these things are going to go in cycles where it's going to become yeah. like in vogue to meet somebody outside of an app. I yeah. think it's already yeah. happening. Like, <laughs> so, yeah. So, so it used to be like a stigma around apps or like mm-hmm. finding someone on the internet. Now the stigma, then the stigma was, you know, finding someone in real life. Yeah. And now maybe the stigma goes back towards finding someone on that. I don't think it particularly matters. Right. right? As long as you find the right person. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I think online or in, you know, at a concert or, Mm -hmm. you know, at church or, Mm -hmm. you know, um, or even at a bar, like Mm -hmm. people say like, Oh, I don't want to meet someone at a bar. It's like, why not? Like (laughs) people go to bars when they're in their twenties, you know, Mm -hmm. like, like that's a thing. That's a place to meet people. Like it Mm -hmm. seems fine to me. Um, but, um, I I get that it might be more difficult now where the expectation is if you're not on the apps, like it's going to be hard to get dates or it's going to be hard to find the right person or, or maybe you're in a small town or maybe, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, something like that. But, um, I don't know. I mean, like, I feel like the, I I feel like there's room for both Mm -hmm. in, in, in that and that there are people out there. Well, let, let's talk, uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about sort of how you're preparing for your children and, uh, and you know, what, what values you're trying to instill in them and how, how you raise them up in a world that's uh, honestly pretty messed up at this point, especially given what's happened the last few years and so on. Um, for me, so yeah, my oldest isn't even four yet. So mm-hmm. just using that. Mm-hmm. It's sort of like a guy like we're s- mm-hmm. slowly over time as it becomes more mature, more cognizant of what's going on. I mean, for us starting with the basics, say, please say, thank you. <laughs> um, earlier this year we started, um, 
my oldest son shaking people's hands and looking them in the eyes when he, when he meets them. Um, and he's made a lot of progress there. Like <laughs> he'll just, when he meets new people, walk up to them and shake their hands and look them in the eye. And we do this little trick, like what color is their eyes? And he has to come back to us be like, all right, they're blue, brown. Um, so at this stage of his life, it's literally just creating, um, just sort of like giving him, the, the context of like, Hey, here's the basics of what you should do. You should say, please, you should say, thank you. You should shake people's hands and show them respect. Um, and then beyond that, it's sort of giving him independence at the same time. Like we let him run around mm. the house, um, and, and do things. We're not helicopter parents mm. in any regards. Let him explore his individuality and that's paid off. He's really independent he can entertain himself um pretty easily but he's also very social when he gets in with a group of kids he's very sociable so for us at our stage it's really just getting down to the basics of please thank you shaking hands and uh, while also giving him autonomy to discover his independence and what he's doing then for the youngest one it's just making sure he doesn't die <laughs> <laughs> fall down the stairs good one. Anything, that's a good one on anything <laughs> No, I mean, I've done a fair amount of reading on this type mm -hmm. of stuff. And from what I can tell is, um, you, you know, hearkening back to my dad's line of, mm -hmm. you know, you have some influence and no control on how your kids turn out is that, you know, the nature nurture debate, mm -hmm. um, uh, falls very, very heavily on nature. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, uh, I do have very little control. Um, there are certain things I can shape in their environment, um, that, that have, you know, maybe that last 5%, you mm -hmm. know, effect. Uh, but even then I think, you know, you know, from what I've read, um, uh, peer groups matter much more than parents, mm. uh, in terms of mm. shaping, uh, kids personalities. You do have some control over that mm. very little, but what schools you send them mm -hmm. to, what neighborhoods, uh, you live, in, uh, yeah. you live in. Um, so those are the types of things that I think about, you know, small things like, you know, what type of food do I, uh, mm -hmm. feed them? Uh, what type of routines do we have as a family? Mm. Um, what type of, uh, you know, traditions do we celebrate mm. those sorts of things? Like, you know, Annalise and I are very intentional about making sure that they have a lot of, um, that all the kids have a lot of, uh, exposure to the rest of their family. Mm. We do things with our cousins. We do things with the grandparents, um, mm -hmm. you know, forming those relationships. However, mm. I will say, I mean, like, you know, to a large extent, the deed is done, mm -hmm. right? They are who they are mm -hmm. and they're going, you know, they're going to grow up uh, a certain way. We have some influence here, mm. but I just, I try not to obsess over it too much. Just knowing that, um, you know, uh, you know, who they hang out with in eighth grade is going to have more influence over their personality and their, their, uh, um, their upbringing than most of the stuff that I do. Right. Um, and so just trying to set up the right environments. Right. Um, and I think, I think there's no bigger environment than where you live. Mm -hmm. And then after that, like what, what schools and how you school them. And I think there's lots of good options uh, for that, but um, those are pretty much where I have any semblance of control. <laughs> and you guys both moved to Austin. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, like after getting married. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, what, what is it? Did you pick Texas for that? I, I'm, I'm guessing for you, well, maybe it's family, but well, I grew uh, up here. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I lived here, you know, first mm -hmm. 18 years of my life. I left mm -hmm. for eight years and actually I moved back here right before mm -hmm. we got married, mm -hmm. um, and had kids. And for me, it was, it was very familiar, right? Mm -hmm. Like I look back on my childhood, my upbringing and, Honestly, like it feels idyllic mm -hmm. looking back on it. Like, um, I like the, um, I like the, the environmental, uh, mm -hmm. things that Texas, mm -hmm. you know, gave me, uh, <laughs> it, 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 if that makes sense at all. Um, meaning like, um, I do think like the environment that someone grows up in does matter much less than, mm -hmm. you know, the nature of who their parents are when, you know, their genetics, but, um, you know, there, there are personality traits that come out of you, uh, growing up in Texas. And I had really fond memories of it. Um, and I was proud of where I was from. 
I always felt like, um, I know people in New York say, you know, I feel like I'm at the center of the universe, Mm -hmm. you know, living in Manhattan in the United States, you know, all the, everyone comes to me. I never, I never felt like that when I was in New York and I always felt like that here. Mm -hmm. Um, that, um, it was, um, to the extent that environment mattered, that this was an ideal environment for children, for families. And, um, yeah, so like moving to Texas was very easy. We spend a lot of time in Wyoming as well. We mm-hmm. go up there every every summer. Um, and uh, but again, like that's more to do with us right now um, than it is to do with the kids. And um, but as the kids get older, you know, uh, it, it'll it'll matter the stability uh, mm-hmm. here. Actually, I'll, br- I'll bring something up. Uh, I don't know what the statistics are on this, but again, like you can control some of these things in your mm-hmm. environment. And again, I'm not. <clears throat> trying to make anyone feel bad. But when I say I had an idyllic upbringing, I was talking to Parker out there uh, a f- couple weeks ago about this is that I think I had out of the, you know, say 40 friends I made over, mm-hmm. you know, from kindergarten to 12th grade, you know, mm-hmm. you have different friends at different times and things like that. I think I had one friend whose parents were divorced. Yeah. Uh, okay. My entire child, like ha- Mm-hmm. And I recognize that that's weird. Mm. Like that, that's an odd, you know, mm-hmm. upbringing, but like all the models I had around me were of extremely stable families. Mm. Um, and I'd be lying if I did, said that I didn't want to recreate that to some extent, you know, for my kids. Cause I have, you know, such a fond recollection of growing up and like, you know, uh, there are places where that's true. Mm. Go there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> we moved to Texas. I mean, like building the family down here and having an environment where our kids could thrive was part of the decision. It was mainly driven by my career and coming mm-hmm. down here to set up the studio and to be around the nexus of, of Bitcoin here in Austin. Um, but uh, I'd be lying if I said, we're going to be here forever. Like it was mm-hmm. a deal my wife and I made like, Hey, we'll go down there for four years and we'll establish your career, but then we're going to move home. And like s- similarly, like even though <clears throat> Philadelphia does not have, uh, the, um, sort of, uh, political leanings that I agree with. <laughs> my family is there. And similar to you, we did have idyllic upbringings in the suburbs of Philadelphia. And similarly, like among, my family, we don't have any divorces and all my good friends, their parents are still married and mm. um, setting that environment, like the environment we just experienced for the last two and a half months at the beach with between my 26 cousins, I think we have 21 kids under the age of seven and wow. most of them were in the circle at the beach uh, all summer. And uh, it's, it's really cool to see just like the different groups of ages of kids like interact with each other. And, um, and even more importantly, like they see how me and my cousins and our spouses interact with each other and then how we interact with our parents or at the beach too. And that environment is something that I, again, I grew up in and want to continue doing. So we'll probably move back to the Philadelphia area just to be mm-hmm. plugged into that environment um, perpetually because when the summer ends, the family goes home, they all live like within like a 10 mile radius of each other in Philadelphia and the party keeps going. Like <laughs> everybody keeps hanging out. Um, and so yeah, like moving down here, um, was predominantly driven by my career and we were able to do that because my kids are still young they're not establishing themselves like out of school yet. Um, so that was our deal moving down here. It was like, Hey, we'll come down here for a few years, establish your career. And then we're going to go back to the family. Um, mm. Uh, at some point in the next year or two. Not if, not if I have anything to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> you know my wife. <laughs> and me too. Like, honestly, like, I, 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 I love yeah. it down here, but like, no, and then it's probably important to bring up due to this conversation. Like, no matter, um, again, Philadelphia is very liberal. Don't uh-huh. agree with a lot of the policies, a lot of the, uh, uh, particularly policy. I love the people of Philadelphia. I grew up in Philadelphia, like despite the political leanings people are, it is true what they say. Like people are tougher in Philly and there's this <laughs> no bullshit mentality that exists that I want my children to grow up with. But again, at the core is like the family um, mm. and depriving my children of 
the familial experience that I had growing up just feels like I'm doing them a disservice. So mm. we'll definitely get back to that at some point. Mm. Um, and again, like my wife's got like summer postpartum like three days after. Cause <laughs> it, it is, it is crazy. It is special. And it is, and that's the other thing too. Like what we have up there, um, it's pretty unique. Um, and, and we're not the only family in the Philadelphia area. It does this. I think Philly is pretty unique that there's a lot of strong, big families. And that's what like in the Island that we go to in the summer, there's like a bunch of, there's like a five or six families that dominate the Island. Mm. Um, and like it's something worth protecting and fighting for per- perpetuating. Like, even though the world's getting more Orwellian and like Philly during COVID um, with mask and mandates and lockdowns is a bit more aggressive than I would like. Um, I do think like what my family has built over generations since they came over from Ireland is like worth trying to save. And I know a lot of the Texans don't agree with me can't save something that's lost, but I think we can save Philadelphia. I think you can. I mean, Austin has the same problems. Austin's yeah. a liberal city. It, uh, <laughs> you know, we got rid of the, uh, most of the homeless, you know, problem down here and stuff like that. Like we all go through stuff like that. Like, you know, and I don't believe like, I'm not trying to raise my kids mm-hmm. in an environment without adversity or mm-hmm. differences or anything like that. And I certainly don't think that like it's a prerequisite even, you know, there are great families in dangerous neighborhoods. There are great mm-hmm. families and you can raise a great family anywhere. My, my, my dad grew up in Texas and he mm-hmm. didn't particularly like his childhood <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, that's okay. Right. Mm-hmm. Like he could still, you know, navigate. So it's not, I, I don't actually feel like there's only a few places you could, you know, do this. You can do it literally anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, being around families about as good of a <laughs> reason as any, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, it's one of the reasons I'm here. Mm. Yeah, it, it's interesting because the sense I get out of both of you is that you're perpetuating something that came before you, right? Like it's you're continuing a legacy that was set before you were born, kind of. And it's um, and it, you're you're taking part in that uh, of of a greater story or something to that effect. Yeah, you hear this a lot, right? Like. You hear it even from people that had rough childhoods. Mm-hmm. They're like, well, I'm going to have a family and I'm not going to do that. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> like that's a great motivation. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I happen to, you know, I just, I mean, mm-hmm. I have nothing to complain about, <laughs> you know, so I'm trying to perpetuate something that came before me, but like, um, I mean, you'd be silly not to like reflect on your own experience. Like mm-hmm. as a child, like I remember it, I was one. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then try to take the best, of that experience and get rid of the worst. Right. Um, and try to set up an environment, uh, for the kids to thrive in. Right. Um, and you can do that in Austin. You can do it in Philly. You can do it in Tulsa and you can do it in Seattle. Like it it doesn't really (laughs) particularly matter all that much. I don't think, um, I'm sure there are some extreme cases, you know, Mm -hmm. out there, but like, um, yeah, especially in the United States, like, you know, I, I don't fall for the doomer stuff. It's like, we have Bitcoin. <laughs> we, we are winning, right? <laughs> there are so many things that are better now than they used to be. Mm. And um, I think this is a great environment to bring kids into and to raise them. And they'll create something better than we did. Mm. I mean, we, we had to get rid of some, some of the boomer stuff that they, uh, <laughs> that they saddled us with, but um, they also gave us a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And then going back to like, it takes a village. Like I lost my dad this year. Um, mm. it's been really tough on our family and, um, understandably so most p- particularly my mother, um, mm. it's been really tough for us from only six months in, uh, but this summer she was down the shore a lot and she had her sisters and her brothers there and her grandkids and her nieces and nephews and their grand and their kids. And, um, I like to think that was a very comforting environment for my mother it was a comforting environment for me my brother and my sister as well. Um, yeah. When you're disconnected from that, like it's, it's hard to get that comfort. Um, yeah. and having that, that village to be there, that village that understands who you are and has the same values of you mm. is important. I think, um, yeah. And that's something my wife and I talk about mm. a lot, especially with in the context of the kids. Like if we didn't have the big family, 
that we do. Um, who knows what my mother's experience would have been like this summer. Who knows what my experience would have been like or how it would have been handled that you have that support group there that's sort of embedded. Yeah. On a lighter hearted note, on, <laughs> on the same idea though, I, I thought about this a lot too is, you know, you know, for the guys out there, um, it's like, who do you think takes care of you when you get older? Mm. Yeah, exactly. It's your kids, especially your female kids. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we only have boys right now. We need to have a girl because yeah. I'm a little bit nervous about, <laughs> uh, about being, being 80 years old, just boys. But like, yeah, I mean like that's the whole, that's kind of the whole point. Yeah. No, it's something society's gotten away from like this whole trend of just dumping your parents in a old folks home. Yeah. That's something I aim. Like, my mom will not be going to home. Um, well, that, that's interesting perspective because in a sense, family is for the bad times, right? It's to make sure that you, you have some sort of connection for when, when you are suffering and when, when there are needs and things like that and not for, Oh, I'm going to party again, go to the bar again or whatever. Like it, it's, it, it, it's more to raise the floor of suffering or, and not suffer too much uh, and have some remedy rather than, you know, like having fun all the time, which is unfortunately a very fiat mentality. Is this, is this why we have so many therapists in the world now? Because <laughs> people don't have families and they're not starting families. It's like, it's like, I, 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 I do think you're right. It's, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, the closest people, <laughs> that know you better than anyone in the mm -hmm. world that if you can build that trust with your family, um, you know, maybe, maybe we wouldn't need so many strangers butting into your life. <laughs> yeah. And like going back to what you said earlier, like imagine being the single 50 year old with no, no kids, maybe you have extended family, but I like to think that mm -hmm. me and my brother, my sister, my wife and my kids have helped, um, my mom get through some, some of the suffering. Like it's going to take time to grieve. The grief will always be there, but I think having the support group in us and then our extended families raises the floor that suffering. Um, definitely. And for me personally too, like it's not, yeah, I'm the oldest lost my dad. I'm, I'm his, like I share a name with him. My son shares a name with him it hit pretty hard and being close to my family this summer really helped a lot. I think. This makes me want to revise one of my answers. You asked, you asked how Bitcoin changed your view uh -huh. on, on some of the stuff. And like, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up like, you know, maybe people who are on the fence, you know, uh -huh. and like I said before, people uh -huh. that don't want kids should not have kids like for real. Like then it's, it's honestly fine. Uh -huh. But like, um, one of the ways Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin did make me a little bit more skeptical mm -hmm. and cynical. And I think that there's people out there who think that the state is going to take care of them mm -hmm. and the state will not take care of them. Mm -hmm. I think there's people that, you know, trust the, you know, large communities. I'm not talking about your neighborhood and, mm -hmm. and your church or your mm -hmm. school or, you know, whatever. I mean, like, you know, your state, your federal <laughs> government. Like, um, you're completely expendable to them. Mm. Uh, you as an individual do not matter. It doesn't matter if you're in a democracy or in a totalitarian dictatorship. Um, uh, there is no bureaucracy that is going to take care of you. That is going to, uh, help you in any way when you get older. Um, you're a statistic and, uh, the only thing over the entire human history, uh, that actually works is nuclear families. Mm. You're just a social security number. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, imagine being like until someone else has it too. <laughs> yeah. Like a 50 year old single person without any family and like you get cancer or something. Are you really going to get comforted by the fact that the government is paying for your cancer treatment? Yeah. <laughs> like, just seems kind of ridiculous, but that that's what a lot of people are setting themselves up for. Yeah, but I think that we could save some people, you know, mm -hmm. who are in that mindset of just like, maybe you're not cynical enough. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, um, is we've already defaulted on our debt. Mm -hmm. We're already monetizing our debt. Mm -hmm. Where do all these social programs come from? Mm -hmm. How just think back 200 years. Like how did people get by when they got older? 
right? Mm -hmm. They rely on each other. They rely on extended family. And um, this idea that like our entire human history has been turned upside down because we invented paper money Mm -hmm. and endless deficits and that we're going to have good old lives, you know, Mm -hmm. into our eighties and nineties without those extended families and nuclear families around us is nonsense. Mm -hmm. Those people die in the streets, Mm -hmm. historically speaking. No, when you quantify just the entitlements alone, it's like $230 trillion. It's like getting close to a quarter of a trillion dollars. Like that's quadrillion. Never, a quadrillion. <laughs> of course, quadrillion. we've defaulted already. Yeah, like, like, no one's paying that back. Your kids aren't paying that back. No. Like, and that's like the interesting thing. Like Social Security, Medicaid is like a third rail that politicians won't touch, but it's like obvious to anybody you can do simple math. Like this isn't getting paid back mm-hmm. and. That's another thing like we were talking about Mm -hmm. in the TFTC discussion is like, when do people just like look at the numbers be like, all right, this is not going to happen. Like (laughs) let's come to grips with this reality and act appropriately. And with that in mind, like you're going to need strong families to get through the chaos that will ensue when people wake up to the fact that they're not going to see that money. Who's going to plow the fields if you don't have, (laughs) if you don't have sons. Yeah. Yeah. Even that cold comfort of the government providing, which honestly isn't nearly as satisfactory, even that they're probably not going to get. Is what no. You guys what are, what are governments in Europe doing? They're <laughs> they're 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 focused on like assisted suicide. Yeah, no, Canada, Canada too. Yeah, yeah, they just wanna, yeah in Canada, yeah, assisted it's just like suicide. how about we just help help kill you instead of you know? Yeah, assisted suicide was something like seven percent of their deaths last year. Wow, what? I did not realize it was that high. It was either two or seven. Mm-hmm. Logan, maybe you can look up the, the stat, but it materially high, more than a percentage point. Oh, my goodness. Well, I guess that's the sad end to uh, <laughs> to your life if you don't, you know, I like, I guess, have, 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 no, we have to do <laughs> it. <happier. laughs> no, no, if you, if you go down the road of uh, sort of like the fiat, you know, single thing kind of, and... I, I don't know. This this episode, I guess, is a, is a case for family, right? Is is what I'm getting. Yeah. 2021, 3.3%. 3.3%. In wow. 2021. Okay. In Quebec, 5%. Okay. 5%? Wow. Yeah. Assisted suicides in Canada. No, I mean, I feel very fortunate. I mean, it's like you said, like, I. Because I had this example growing up. Again, very close family, extended family nuclear family and there's never a question like yeah i'm gonna recreate this i'm gonna keep this going um and again every my aunts and uncles my parents my cousins like not one divorce across the board and mm-hmm. everybody looks after each other and when my grandmother and grandfather were still alive like they would sit in the middle of the beach circle and see their kids their grandkids their great grandkids and like the joy that brought them was like something to strive for. Like they were that 75 year old couple, like looking at their legacy and like very content with it. And my grandfather was a union worker and my grandmother worked at the mayor's office in Philadelphia. Like it was nothing, they weren't like crazy rich or anything like that. Their kids were very successful. And their grandkids, a lot of us are very successful. And hopefully our kids will be too, but they, they had very blue collar jobs coming up how selfish of it would have been for you to not build on top of that yeah yeah and that's all of us really yeah. i mean even if you came from a broken family or something like that like you get you get the opportunity to set it right yeah and then like, i have to give props to my dad's so i think my grandmother and grandfather on that side same deal yeah. grandmother was an accountant grandfather was a union worker he was a steam fitter um my uncle and his wife and my cousin on that side of the family they're strong um yeah like all around both sides is taught us good lessons growing up hopefully you can perpetuate that with the next generation it's the plan (laughs) well hopefully that uh inspires you hopefully that uh gets you to want to i don't know propagate the human race i guess um, but thank you both for, for being on. Are, are there any things that you want to promote or any, uh, any specific things that you want to talk about briefly? Uh, 
Uh, I have. I mean, I love my children. I love my wife. I love my family. <laughs> I don't know, I'm a simple man. Like, <laughs> You're promoting your family. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I don't want this to come off like braggy either, but okay. it's just like, it's the truth. It's like, mm. it's what it is. And I'm very, feel very fortunate to have it. Um, yeah, you can go to tftc.io if you want to hear <laughs> my thoughts on the economy and Bitcoin. <laughs> there you go. Will? Uh, I'd just say it's easier than most uh, conventional conventional wisdom will tell you mm -hmm. uh people try to scare you off from it mm -hmm. um uh the state will tell you that uh or will punish you financially for it N none of it matters uh you should uh if you want to uh mm -hmm. you know take the plunge no one's ever thinks that they're ready but you're built to do it and and you know you should uh without being too preachy mm -hmm. and uh do you do show notes uh, I can. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll throw in a, a, a plug for my sister-in-law, who's put together a great homeschooling curriculum. Oh, uh, that's uh, uh, she does. She's just been doing that for what ten years now. Uh -huh. um, and uh, if if people want to see what that looks like, okay. Well, thank you both, and uh, yeah, let's let's make Bitcoin Nation really fruitful. Thank you. You, you did your job, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Unchained Capital is a sponsor of this podcast. I'm an advisor to the company. I know the team well, and I'm excited for what they are building. If you need multi-sig, collaborative custody, or a Bitcoin-native financial services partner, learn more at unchained.com.